Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Paul Cassidy's here at the Manic Expression Theatre. Tonight's presentation will be pictures at an exhibition, an adaptation of Modest Mussorgsky's Suite by James Daniel Walsh, as read by Antonio Mateo Garcia. Your editor for this presentation will be Rubes Marina. And now, ladies and gentlemen, pictures at an exhibition. The composer sat and stared up at the pieces, framed with care, hung behind a velvet rope. Victor Hotman was an inspiration. His work spoke to the composer in a way that few artists could. The Russian painter and architect, who tragically died at the age of 39 from an aneurysm, depicted life in such a way that one could not help but be inspired. When the composer heard that the Long Beach Museum of Art would have an exhibition, he had to attend. His salvation depended on it. Sadly, when the composer glanced down from Hotman's masterpieces to his own stack of papers, he found the bars stretched across, crumpled white pages, still empty. Empty as his soul was empty as his life had been low these last few years. This was to be the last page of music for his suite, an all-consuming project he had lived with for nearly ten years. There was no inspiration to be had here among the few remaining masterpieces of Hotman's that time had not consumed. The composer was bereft of ideas, his music had abandoned him now when he needed it the most. The composer ran his hands through white hair that not so very long ago was dark and thick. He looked down at those hands and felt his despair deepen. Oh, the greatness he once achieved with these hands. He wrote symphonies that made the world cheer, music that inspired his generation. These were the hands that held the baton which hundreds of musicians were led by. More importantly than all that, these were the hands that held her. These hands, now withered, were once strong. They were meant to protect her, to keep her safe. What a failure he was. The composer rose to his feet, his knees shaky. He reached for the baggie in his coat pocket. Empty. When had he taken the last pill? He didn't even remember doing it. Soon, his skin would burn, his eyes wide with the red agony he felt without his pills. Inspiration would have to wait. The composer hadn't much time. He hurried through the crowd, all gazing up at the remaining work of Victor Hotman. How he wished to stay, to casually stroll through the exhibition, and be moved by the work of a true master. Instead, he would seek refuge in numbness, and leave the inspiration for those with futures ahead of them. Instead of pasts, they looked to escape. Number one, the gnome. The walk to Fourth Street grew more agonizing with every step. The composer cursed himself. How could he be foolish enough to run out of pills? In the last year, the acquisition of drugs became his sole purpose in life. He loved no one, and his music was hardly a preoccupation. No. All the composer needed was sweet relief. 
found in the dulling embrace of narcotics. His supplier resided in a rundown flop house. The window is blacked out with newspaper. The composer burst through the door and found himself staring down the barrel of a gun. He did not flinch. He simply placed his hand against the weapon and pushed it aside, finding the grinning face of the gnome on the other end. You're fucking crazy! The little man laughed, tucking his gun into the waistband of his pants. Heh! <laughs> Busting through the door like the police! That's a good way to get yourself shot! The gnome was a little Puerto Rican man with a crooked nose and deep-set eyes. His strong body was clad in a skin-tight wife beater and baggy jeans, gold glittering around his neck and on several fingers. The composer couldn't recall the pusher's real name. He had heard it many times, always while high. Rather than ask for him to repeat his name, which the composer was sure this little man would see as an insult, he came to think of him simply as the gnome which he, of course, kept to himself. You look like shit, bro, the gnome said, holding the shaky composer at arm's length. You run out of that good shit I gave you? The composer nodded. I wasn't paying attention, he mumbled, doing his best not to throw up. The gnome pointed a stubby finger in his client's face, that's bad for your health, he said. Luckily for you, I got some bum-ass shit in today. Wipe your mind clean, just like you like. The gnome whistled, and from out another room, a young girl emerged. She was lean and tall, her blonde hair and pigtails. The composer wasn't sure how old she was, but he was sure she wasn't legal. Her tight body was barely concealed in a blue tube top and a white mini skirt. Her platform shoes causing her to tower above the gnome. She carried a silver tray, and upon that tray was a baggie filled with purple pills. Here you go, baby, she said to the gnome in a high, squeaky voice. The gnome gave her a kiss, more tongue than lips, and turned back to the composer. I call this shit juxtaposition, he said with a smile. Take it and find out why. The composer felt every atom of his being, down to his hair, begin to burn like wild fire. I just, <coughs> he coughed. I just needed my usual. No, 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 son, the gnome said with a smile. Trust me, you want this new shit. The gnome turned to his young companion, wrapped around him like a boa constrictor. Why don't you give the nice man a taste, little Sally? The girl, the Sally, took the baggie off the tray and approached the composer. A sexy smile spread across her red lips. She removed a pill from the bag, running her manicured fingers over his chest. He tried to resist. Sally was so young, not much older than she had been. Just open wide, Sally whispered in his ear. He couldn't resist. He was so weak, so sick, and she was so pretty. He opened his mouth and she stuck her fingers inside, dropping the pill on his tongue. The effects of juxtaposition were almost instantaneous. The composer felt all of his pain melt away, replaced by an overpowering alertness. This wasn't the high he was looking for. The composer felt Sally's soft hands on his face, and he grew hard. Her breath on his neck was like the warm breeze from off a July sea. He felt everything now, from the itchy fabric of his coat to the very darkness surrounding him. All he wanted was to feel nothing. 
and the gnome instead gave him every sensation all at once. So alert was the composer that he felt Sally's other hand slipping into his coat pocket, trying to lift his wallet. He grabbed her wrist and looked up at her. She was laughing at him, eyes ablaze. The gnome stepped forward, a balled up fist crushing the composer's nose in one brutal strike. His over heightened senses screamed as blood gushed down his face. He could see nothing but a vibrant red veil pulsing before his eyes. He felt strong hands holding his arm behind his back. He heard someone say, Get this fucking wallet! The world was all pain now, all terror. As vision returned to the composer's eyes, so did the rest of his senses. The gnome had his arm bent painfully behind his back as Sally rummaged through his pockets. The composer stretched out his fingers. He felt the gnome's tank top, his belt, and something else. Something... metal. The composer grabbed the butt of the gnome's gun and yanked it from his pants. <coughs> Sally screamed and the gnome released the composer, both taking a step back. The composer pointed the gun at the both of them, shaking off the last bit of pain. His heart jack rabbit in his chest. He had never held a gun before. What do you think you're going to do with that maricon? The gnome spat. Sally hiding behind him. The composer had no answer. Instead, he just stuck out his free hand. Give me the pills, he demanded. The gnome didn't move, his face hard. He would take a bullet before he surrendered his stupid Latin pride. The composer was not impressed. Give me the pills! He screamed. All that mattered was the release. Give him the pills. A voice floated in from the other room. The composer looked up anxiously and found a gorgeous black woman in a white nightly standing in the doorway behind the gnome and Sally. Her hair was braided, a joint hanging from between her lips. I'm not giving this punk shit, the gnome growled. This wasn't a request, the goddess said through a lilting French accent. Give him the pills, right now. Do you understand me? The gnome looked away and he swallowed his pride. Yes, Rihanna, he said. He picked up the baggie of juxtaposition and slammed it hard into the composer's outstretched hand. He gave the composer a murderous but impotent look. Now go, Juliana said to the composer. Enjoy oblivion. The composer backed away. He felt for the doorknob, always keeping the gun pointed at the criminals in front of him. He flung the door open, stepped back out into the light, and slammed the door shut. He stood there for a long moment, staring at the cracked paint, his heart thumping a mile a minute. He shoved the pills in his pocket, the gun in his waistband, and turned to face a world of senses he didn't want to feel. Number two, V. 
The Old Castle Despite the clouds in the sky, the composer had never seen a brighter day. The light burned the eyes from his head. The street noise deafened him. The vomit that had churned in his stomach all morning long finally erupted from his mouth, coating the wall of a convenience store. There was no food in what he expelled, only stomach acid. Everywhere the composer wandered, people cleared a path. They watched him with disgust, with curled lips and judgmental eyes. Let them. He viewed them the same way. These creatures hopping from shop to shop, cell phones at the ready to share their every banal moment. With juxtaposition running through his system, the composer could read under their skins. The brunette buying stockings to arouse her married lover, the blimp in the suit, respectable by day, pedophile by night. The young couple in the convertible, celebrating their third anniversary of having settled for one another. Let these monsters judge him. Yes, he was a pathetic junkie. Hurt we all? The composer's feet began to ache, the pain heightened by the drug coursing through his veins. He couldn't keep walking. He didn't even know where he was going. All he wanted was rest, to wait, and let this cursed juxtaposition pass through his system. When it had, he would sell the remaining pills he had, or exchange them for a drug that would take him away from his senses rather than drown him in them. The composer looked up and found himself in the shadow of Gaetonia. The apartment complex, positioned on a hilltop in Belmont Heights, was designed to look like an old medieval castle. The building had a steep roof, turrets, battlements, chimney pots, a coat of arms, and a series of arched and square windows with heavily paned glass. Atop it all was a neon sign, the word Gaetonia, glowing for all to see. A palm tree towered over the composer, and he sat beneath it and shut his eyes. He would not be able to sit here long. In Gaetonia dwelled the wealthy of Long Beach. All it would take was for one such affluent individual to see him sitting here, and the police would be called. The prospect of being arrested did not scare the composer. The thought of having his name in the newspapers, trumpeting the downfall of one of music's most respected symphonists, did not scare the composer. However, the thought of not being able to get his hands on more drugs, the thought of detoxing and having to face reality, that terrified the composer to his very core. There came a small woman's voice to his left, and the composer opened his eyes to find he had a fellow addict resting outside Gaetonia. This lady's drug of choice came in a bottle. She sat back against the building's exterior, brown liquor dribbling from her mouth. She was dressed like a cowgirl, her hat, checkered shirt, and jeans, all tattered rags. Her reddish hair was matted under that Stetson. Her long Ekram face was smudged from the dirt of hundreds of days without bathing. Yet, even under all that grime, the composer recognized his companion. Is this my wife I see before me? He asked, blinking his eyes in disbelief. She looked up at him. A faint smile of recollection crossing her chapped lips. She leaned forward, offering him the bottle. Their eyes met, each clouded over by their drug of choice. Yet, while his wife's senses were gloriously dull, the composers were razor sharp. He could see past the inebriation to the woman he once loved, the woman he trusted, the woman who let him down.
the composer smacked the bottle away, hoping it would fly from his wife's hand and shatter. No such luck. She held on for dear life, refusing to spill a drop. She looked at him, eyes as indifferent as ever, and took another swig of cheap release. The composer rose to his feet to look down on his bride. Still pretending to be a cowgirl, I see, he spat. That's where you were when we needed you, wasn't it? Off riding horses, indulging your pathetic schoolgirl fantasies? I'm no cowgirl! His wife slurred, lips kissing the bottle. Sold my horse, drank her away. You're pathetic! The composer roared. You spent your time hiding from me, hiding from her. And what did it get you? Who are you now? You're no one. You're nothing. Just some pathetic drunk still hiding. His wife looked up and into his eyes. A spark of recognition crossed her face. She smiled. Aren't we all? She asked. The composer's anger melted away in an instant. Shame washing over him. She was right. Who was he to judge how she coped with this misery known as life? Here he stood, high as a kite, a stolen gun hidden on him. How was he any better than her? The composer turned and walked away. The gurgling sound of his wife drowning herself in cheap booze growing faint behind him. Tears welled in his eyes, and he did not stifle them. As he made his way down 2nd Street, the sea of people parted for the weeping man wailing past them. Number three, Tuileries. The composer remembered a simpler time, when all seemed ideal. He was at the height of his profession, happily married, living in a lovely home. He began work on what was to be his masterpiece, the same piece he struggled with still. Most importantly, he had Melody. She was all any man could ask for in a daughter. As an infant, she rarely cried only made the world brighter with her easy smile. He awoke each morning to the sound of her excited laughter. He fell asleep each night to the quiet breeze of her breath. His heart, which sat empty too long, overflowed with the joy of fatherhood. One day, when Melody was only four years of age, the composer was disturbed from his work by the sound of arguing. He peeked out the window of his office, looking out onto the lush garden behind his home. There was his wife, 
trying to teach Melody to ride her horse. Fatherly pride did not prevent the composer from seeing his child was behaving like a brat. Her mother was trying to share with her a love of horses, one that Melody simply did not have in her own heart. His wife tried to place the child on the horse, and Melody kicked and whined. Her mother grew frustrated and kicked the dirt at the horse's feet. It was like watching two children argue. Melody behaved this way with her mother for a lack of a single word in his wife's vocabulary. No. No is the word you must say to a child you love. Aside from love, no is the most important word. No teaches a child boundaries, shows them the limits of their power. No keeps them safe helps them understand how relationships work. No is the word every child should hear, and one that Melody rarely ever heard from her mother. The composer rose to his feet and walked down to the backyard. Melody, upon seeing him, ran into his arms. He picked her up and carried her. Her arms wrapped around his neck in a tight embrace. She loved it when he took breaks from his work and played with her. The composer lifted his daughter up and placed her on the horse. But Papa, she pouted, I don't like horses. Perhaps not, he responded with a smile. But your mother is trying to teach you something. Listen to her and behave. Learn from her. He pointed a warning finger in her face, and when he was sure she had taken his advice to heart, he poked her in the nose with that finger. She laughed. The composer turned to face his wife, expecting a smile and a thank you. Instead, she looked upset, her eyes angry. She stormed past him, lips puckered too tight with sour feelings for gratitude to escape. She led the horse away an unhappy melody on its back. Later that night, she would accuse her husband of showing her up. This was not the first time such an accusation would be leveled against him, nor the last. Despite such objections, the composer did his level best to be a good father to Melody every day of her life. Number four, cattle. The house was gone. There was no lush garden in the back, no horse stables. The composer now lived in a hotel room. His only view, a brick wall. There was a bed that squeaked, a dresser with no handles, and a sink, but no toilet. The only bit of home the composer kept was his desk, where he had once crafted such beautiful music Sitting there now, staring down at the empty bars on that crumpled piece of sheet paper, the composer could not remember what it felt like to make music. He recalled once telling his wife that it was like soaring through heaven. Try though he might, the composer could not recall that feeling, let alone recapture it. He felt sick again the juxtaposition wearing off. He looked to the window and saw the blistering brilliance of day beating in on him. He did not dare try to sell or trade his stolen supply of drugs till the cover of night. But night would not come in time. By the time the sun set, the composer would be too sick to move, his insides on fire. Even now, he felt his stomach acid rising, ready to be expelled. Beside his empty sheet paper was the baggie of juxtaposition. He couldn't bear to feel the effects of the drug again. He wanted his senses dulled, not heightened. The thought of taking one, even to get him through the night, was too much. However, the thought of taking them all was a possibility. 
suicide was not a foreign concept to the composer. In the days after losing everything he loved, the thought of taking his life seemed only logical. However, the human instinct for survival is a powerful opponent. Even when we long for an end to the suffering, we can't help but want one more breath and one more after that. Yet, at this moment, life seemed more than the composer could stomach. A continued existence felt like a heavy cart he was yoked to. He had trudged up the muddy hill of life, hauling with him a cart that grew ever heavier with each day. Looking up and seeing the possibility of another 40 years felt impossible to tolerate. The composer opened the baggie and poured the pills down his throat. He swallowed them dry in three gulps. They hit his stomach like a lead weight, their effect almost immediate. His senses did not erupt, as was the drug's intended purpose. Instead, he felt each breath grow thick and heavy, harder to push through his lungs with every passing moment. His stomach revolted, but not to give up its contents. He lost his equilibrium and fell from his chair to the crusty brown carpet. Warm foam dribbled from his lips. His heart sped up, hammering inside of him, struggling to keep the blood flowing. Then, the struggle too great, his heart began to slow down. Light left the world. Darkness closed in. Yet still, the composer struggled for one more breath. Just one more breath. And then, one more after that. Number five, Ballet of the Unhatched Chicks. The composer awoke in another world, somewhere between life and death. The colors of his shabby little room was inverted, like the negative of a photograph. Standing above him, glowing like neon, were two creatures beyond his comprehension. I am Hope, the female said. She was nude, her beautiful body glowing brilliantly as if lit from within. I am despair the male said. He was also nude, a hulking beast of a man with dreadlocks. His own inner glow was dark, like a black light, and his smile contradicted the title which he claimed. Am I dead? The composer asked. Almost, Despair said with a nod. Just give in. Soon you will be at peace. Hope looked up at her companion a horrified expression on her face. Don't tell him that, she gasped. Her attention turned back to the composer, lying on the floor. You don't have to die. There's still time. Think of what a waste it would be. Waste? Despair said with a chuckle. Ha! The only waste is to continue to live and suffer. Hope waved Despair's words away. Don't listen to him. He doesn't care anything for you. As if you do, 
Despair said with a roll of his eyes. And just what do you mean by that? Hope asked him, hands on her hips. As if you didn't know, spreading your gospel to every poor soul trying to check out. Can't you just let the man die in peace? He's made up his mind. Hope stuck a warning finger in Despair's face. Back off, buddy, she growled. Despair looked down at the tiny woman half his size and nonchalantly slapped her hand away. Make me glow warm. Hope punched Despair in the arm. Despair tugged on Hope's long glowing hair. Soon, their hands were flailing about each hurling insults at the other as the composer lay on the ground, his face in his hand. The squawking of these two beings, each imbued with such power, was giving the object of their squabble a headache. Even in death, there was no peace. The composer rose to his feet and stood between hope and despair, slapping away their hands and holding them apart. Enough! He roared. What will end this petty arguing? Choose another day of life, Hope said, barely held at bay from resuming her attack. Just one more day? The composer asked. Yes, please, she begged. Despair tried to make a counter-argument, which Hope drowned out by repeating, Please! Over and over and over again, at the top of her lungs. Fine, the composer cried out. Just one more day. A smile crossed Hope's face. She looked up at Despair, who fumed in his defeat, and stuck out her tongue. With that, the composer awoke back to life, vomit spewing from his mouth like a volcano. He lay there for several agonizing minutes, throwing up all the drugs in his system until there was nothing left. Finally, his body purged. The composer found himself alive and horribly sober. Number six, Samuel Goldenberg and Schmuel. No sooner had the composer returned from the beyond than he was out to find his way back. Sobriety was too much to bear, the world so terrifyingly in focus. All the composer wanted was the precious numbing that came with his beloved pills. But how to fetch them? He had no money left and no juxtaposition to trade. All he had was the gun stolen from the gnome. So he fled the stench of his room and entered the early evening. His weapon stuffed in his coat pocket. He would rob someone, hold them up at gunpoint. Yes, then he would have the money he needed to push the world away. How to go about it? The composer was not a violent man. Until his confrontation with the gnome this morning, he never even held a gun. Now, he was expected to convincingly threaten a stranger like a common thug? What choice did he have? The past was clawing at his brain, demanding attention. He wanted none of it. All the composer wished for was the quiet stupor of his beloved pills. So he stopped the night, searching for someone, anyone he could take advantage of. His wanderings led him to Temple Israel, where a Sabbath service was just letting out. The faithful headed for their cars, families of happy, smiling people. The composer watched the synagogue clear out, memories filling his own head of a faith he lost long ago. He wanted to believe, as these people did, that there was some higher power guiding his life. He didn't. He looked around the world and saw only pinballs launched toward one destination or another, often crashing into each other. If there was a god, he lost interest in us long ago. One couple did not head toward the car. They were older, holding onto each other just to stand and yet in no hurry to call it a night. They took a staircase down to the beach below, and the composer followed. The beach would be fairly deserted this evening, and in the cover of night, he would strike fear in this elderly couple fresh from their holy temple. You don't pay attention, Ira, 
the old woman chastised her husband as they reached the bike path on the beach. Rabbi Grinblatt could not have been clearer. The path to the righteous man is treacherous due to the injustice of lesser people. That is not what he meant, Greta, I recounted in his thick German accent. The path of the righteous man is treacherous because life itself is treacherous. Remember, he mentioned the rocky road of life, said to beware the temptations of the easy path. Greta shook her head. The easy path is the one taken by lesser people, she said. I would think after the horrors we escaped, you would see that life is beautiful and people are corrupt. The composer listened to the older couple, the gun heavy in his hand. As they argued over the sermon, they just heard he was working up the nerve to call their attention to his weapon. Finally, they heard his footfall behind them and glanced back. Ira saw the gun and his old face lined with fear. He shielded his wife. What do you want? He asked, his voice quiet and shaking. The composer flushed with shame and held the gun out. I need money, he said. I won't hurt you if you give me your wallet. He's not giving you nothing, Greta growled, pushing herself out from behind her husband. Ira tried to restrain her, but the bent old woman shuffled toward the composer, wagging a finger at him. On her arm, he could see a series of numbers tattooed on her flesh. Please, the composer begged, unable to feign strength. You don't understand. I understand, all right, Greta chastised, pulling forward despite Ira's hand on her shoulder. I can see you shaking, you junkie. Why don't you clean up your life and get a job? Such a shameful thing, robbing an old couple. What must your family think of you? At the word family, the composer stiffened his gun arm. The memories were close now, dangerously close. He needed to forget, and for that, he needed a fix. He would yank the purse off of Greta's arm and be gone before she could scream. He would find a dealer, buy some pills, and hide inside the haze. He had to. The composer stepped forward, ready to snatch an old lady's purse. When the old lady surprised him, she grabbed hold of the handle of her bag and slammed it into the side of his head as hard as she could, sending him crashing to the ground. The world faded in and out, and the composer laid there, looking out at the dark ocean stretching out to forever. What on earth did that woman have in her purse? It felt like a brick. Greta picked up the gun. I'll take this so you can't hurt nobody, she said. Then she reached into her handbag and removed a thick book. This I leave you. You need it more than I do. Greta laid the book beside the composer, and as she and her husband hurried away, he read the title on the spine. The Torah, the five books of Moses. With that, the world around him vanished, and he passed out cold. Number seven, Limoges, the market. Unconscious by the sea, the composer was helpless against his memories. He remembered conducting his orchestra, a hundred musicians following along to his baton. There was an enraptured audience to his back, hanging on every note. As the piece came to an end, he raised his baton high, the orchestra sustaining that note. He lingered, a smile creeping over his face. He was milking the moment, he knew, but it was such a perfect moment. Finally, he brought the whole orchestra to a crescendo, and the audience leapt to their feet, cheering. He turned and took his bow, then bowed to the orchestra, who each bowed their head to him. Life was good, better than good. Life was perfect. Well, not quite perfect.
His wife was not in attendance this evening. Her horse needed her. The composer barely noticed. His wife had not attended a concert in nearly a year, and even when she had, she never had a kind word to say, only indifference. Lately, he had accepted that her passion for horses was greater than her passion for him, and far greater than any passion she may have had for being a mother. The composer exited the stage, and just on the other side of the curtains, he saw Melody. She was 13 now, her once gangly form replaced by a beautiful young lady's body. She was lovely in a sundress, standing before a huge canvas that would serve as the backdrop for tomorrow night's opera. The background was of a market in the French city of Limoges, the front of the store covered in purple flowers. Melody seemed enraptured by the canvas, staring up with wide eyes, caressing it with curious fingers. From behind her, a stagehand approached. The composer, having been a young man not so very long ago, recognized the look on the boy's face. He tapped on Melody's shoulder, and she turned around. He flashed her a toothy smile, and she rolled her eyes and moved to the other side of the canvas. Good girl. The stagehand was not detoured, however. He followed her to the other side, tapped her on her shoulder again. He said something the composer could not hear over the continued applause of the audience, and Melody slapped the cap from atop his head and scurried back to the other side of the canvas. The stagehand picked up his hat and looked about for inspiration. There, in a jar behind the canvas, was a pot of fake daffodils. He plucked one and hurried back to Melody, tapping her on the shoulder again. She turned around, her hand balled up into a fist. The boy jumped back, covered his head with his right hand, and extended the flower to her with his left. This time, Melody paused, took the flower, and smiled at him. The stagehand peeked out from between his fingers, returned the girl's smile, and stepped closer to her. Now the composer intervened, barking at the stagehand and hurrying toward him, brow raised. The boy, fear in his eyes, hurried off, and Melody turned to her father with anger in her eyes. Why did you chase him off? She asked. He was nice. Melody, he's a good decade older than you, the composer said sternly. You must watch out for men like that. You are still a young girl. I am nearly a woman, she argued back and stormed off in a huff. The applause of the audience was finally dying down, and the high that came with their adulation faded with it. His little girl was in such a rush to grow up, and for the first time in her life, her father felt a tremor of fear for her. Perhaps this was a phase that all girls went through, or maybe his melody was headed for troubled times. Number eight, catacombs. One memory gave way to another. Years passed, and the attention Melody received from men only grew as her body matured. By the time she was 15, she was a changed girl, leaving the house in outfits that made her father blush. The composer would plead with his wife, Please, spend less time with the horse and more time with our daughter. She needs you. Look at how she dresses. His wife would roll her eyes and swat away his worries. That's just how girls dress now. She's fine. However, by the end of that year, all was not fine. Melody was arrested for shoplifting. The police let her off with a warning, yet Melody was defiant. When the composer tried to ground her, she would sneak out her window to meet friends, mostly male. The composer would plead with his wife, Please spend less time with the horse and more time with our daughter. She needs you. Look at the trouble she's getting into. His wife would roll her eyes and swat away his worries. She's just rebelling. All girls do. She's fine. However, on Melody's 16th birthday, all was not fine. 
she had become increasingly erratic, and the composer became convinced she was using drugs. When he confronted her about this, she threatened suicide, and he checked her into a hospital to get help. The composer would plead with his wife, Please spend less time with the horse and more time with our daughter. She needs you. Look at where she is right now. His wife would roll her eyes and swat away his worries. She's just going through a hard time, as all girls do. She's fine. Upon leaving the hospital, Melody's behavior grew worse. She was staying out all night with much older men, skipping school, and her drug use grew more advanced. The composer stopped pleading with his wife. Perhaps she was using the horse as an excuse to hide from the responsibilities that came with raising a troubled child. Or perhaps she simply didn't care. Either way, he knew it was up to him to save his melody. One night, he waited for her to sneak out and he followed her. Melody got into a car driven by a much older man and was taken to a sleazy bar called the Catacombs in a bad part of town. The composer parked across the street and crossed through a herd of motorcycles to reach the front door of the bar. The music inside was loud, the lights dim, the air choked with smoke. The composer wandered this den of sin, glared at by bearded men who knew he did not belong. Each of them had an underage girl on their arms. The eyes of these girls glazed over with inebriation. The composer looked from one young face to the next, at once hoping to find his daughter and yet terrified of what he would find when he did. There was a commotion in the back. The composer squinted to see three men scurrying about, fear in their eyes. Something was wrong back there, and instinctively, the composer headed for the ruckus. He caught glimpses of a young girl lying limp on a green couch as these men paced back and forth, arguing with one another. Finally, he caught sight of her face. The girl was Melody, and she was not moving. The composer pushed his way past a large man in a leather jacket. The man grabbed him, turned him around, and hit the composer in the face as hard as he could. Blood and teeth filled the composer's mouth, yet he shook off the pain and tried to get to his daughter. A pool cue broke across his back, sending him to the floor in a crumpled ball. Still, he tried to get to his daughter. The boots of untold number of men stomped him kicked him, broke bones with indifference. Still, the composer crawled, clawing at the tiled floor, desperate to reach his child. When finally, the composer reached the green couch where Melody lay, the three men that had surrounded her looked down at him and seemed to know his face. They spoke in panicked voices, impossible to hear over the music. As one song ended and another began, the composer caught the distant wail of a siren and suddenly the bar cleared. All the motorcycles outside roared away as the composer pulled his broken body up onto the couch with his daughter. There was a needle sticking out of Melody's arm. Her eyes were open, but there was no life behind them. The composer pulled her close, called her name. She was limp in his arms. He begged her to wake up. She did not. She never would again. Number nine, the hut on hen's legs. The composer opened his eyes and found them wet, lying on the bike path near the crashing ocean, a copy of the Torah beside him. The composer felt only one thing. He did not feel the pain in his head or the sickening absence of drugs in his system. Oh, if only he was capable of feeling such bliss. No, his agony was that of a father, arms full of a lifeless child he was unable to save from herself. Melody had been dead three years now, and in that time, 
the composer chose to dive headfirst into the addictions that killed his child. He did not deserve the life he knew, one of wealth and acclaim. His melody was cold in the ground. It was all his fault. Perhaps he should have shown her a firmer hand, or maybe he was too strict. Perhaps if he had talked to her more, or maybe he interfered too much. Perhaps if he had dragged her mother to therapy, or maybe he should have simply divorced her and taken Melody away. Looking back, the composer had no clear answer to what he should have done. He only knew that what he did do was insufficient. The composer rose to his feet, shaking the tears from his eyes. He could not feel this. He would not. He would sooner set himself on fire than to live with this agony. Melody, his sweet little child, was gone. The sun would never shine again. The composer heard the click-clack of shoes behind him. He turned to find an old woman approaching, bathed in darkness. She came near him, her wooden shoes loud against the pavement. She wore heavy burlap clothes and a hood that hid her face. She raised a bony arm in his direction and twitched out a twig of a finger, pointing right at him. Who are you? The composer asked, swallowing back fear. The old woman stopped under a street lamp and raised her hood. Her thinning hair was white, her face covered in boils. Her eyes were milky with blindness, yet she saw him clear as day. Her mouth cracked open into a near toothless smile, and she ran her tongue over chapped lips. He was reminded of tales his Russian grandmother would tell him as a child of the witch Baba Yaga. Her stories of the old crone had given the composer nightmares as a boy. And here stood that nightmare come to life. I am grief, the old woman said. I have finally found you. The composer stumbled backwards, shaking his head. No. He mumbled, I will not see you. You are not welcome. The old woman laughed. <laughs> Grief never is welcome, she said. Yet here I stand, all the same. You tried to outrun me, but I was always just behind you. There is no fog in which you can escape now, no haze to hide in. The composer turned to flee and found grief suddenly behind him. Your child is dead, she said bluntly. The composer stumbled into the sand and fell to his knees, where, to his shock, grief also stood. There was nothing you could do to save her, she clucked with her thick tongue. The composer rose to his feet and backed away, eyes always on the old woman. She bumped into someone behind him, turned and found himself looking into the empty eyes of grief. She was everywhere. You cannot escape me, she said. There is no way to outrun the truth. That which was most precious to you has been wiped clean from this earth. And you must accept that. The composer felt a rush of panic. Never! He cried and ran away from the old hag. He found her to his left, to his right. He found her in front of him and at his back, never running yet always keeping pace. In the darkness of night, the composer lost his sense of direction and found himself at last tripping and stumbling into the cold waters of the Pacific Ocean. The tide pulled on him, his heavy coat dragging him down. Here, under the waves, the old witch did not follow. Here, all was quiet. Perhaps this was where he belonged, in the quiet of the ocean. Grief would not follow him there. And in a moment or two, the water would fill his lungs. 
Melody was down here, in the darkness. Perhaps he would see her again, if only in that moment before his brain function ceased. Death would be a small price to pay to see his beloved daughter. Number 10, The Bogatier Gates. As the ocean dragged the composer further out and deeper down, he felt small but strong hands grab hold of him. He was pulled free from his coat, and against his will, he emerged from the waves. To his surprise, his feet touched the ground, the water only coming up to his chest. He looked around for his savior but found only grief standing on the shore, waiting for him. Why do you haunt me? The composer yelled. I am here because you feel me, grief said quietly. Yet he still heard her above the crash of the waves. What do you want from me? Your masterpiece, grief whispered. You must finish it. Why should I? The composer growled. Why should I do anything more? It was for her. It was all for her. Without her, they are just notes, as random as drops of rain from heaven. She would want you to finish it. The composer shook his head. I hate my music now. Without melody, every note is sour. She loved your music, Grief said. She loved you. The composer's eyes overflowed. She's dead, he screamed. You keep reminding me of that, reminding me of her. He splashed through the waves towards Grief, fists raised. There are days I am scared to death that I'll never forget her smile or how soft her hand was against my cheek. Without her, what am I going to do? Finally, the composer fell to his knees on the shore, right at Grief's feet. What am I going to do? He wept and buried his face in the sand. The composer cried harder than at any moment before in his life. He wept for a life he once loved, a family he belonged to, all gone now. A daughter lost to vice, a wife drinking herself to death as punishment for her indifference. He longed to stand upon a stage again, an orchestra before him, and an audience behind him. When the final note was played, his wife and child would cheer so loud he would hear them amidst the din, and he would know he was loved. Never again. A light suddenly erupted somewhere above the composer, and he looked up at grief before him. The old woman was gone. Standing there, lit up as bright as hope had been, was someone new. She was nude, her hair blown back on the ocean breeze like strands of sparkling electric wires. She was beautiful beyond words, the light shining from within her like the sun. Who are you? The composer asked. The woman smiled down at him. I am grief, she said. He stared hard at her face and recognized her. She was younger now, but she was the same woman. I don't understand, the composer said, tears still streaming down his face. You only saw what I looked like on the outside, she said, caressing his face. Outside, I'm terrifying, and I do apologize for that. Inside, I am light and healing. I come at times of tragedy, but I am not to be feared. I am a friend who will sit with you and cry. The composer wept, looking up at grief, holding out his hands. I can't go on, he said. Melody was my baby. My baby, I held her in my arms the day she was born. She slept on my chest when she was no bigger than a shoe. She was my responsibility. And I failed her. Grief shook her head. 
There are courses you can correct and others you cannot. You did your best to save your child, and you did it without the help of a partner. You fought her cravings and her desires. You fought her stubbornness. No matter what you did, Melody was always going to be Melody. Some parents would have given up, as your wife did. You reached out to your daughter, tried to guide her. Foolishly, she saw her own path, one in which she hid from her feelings. She could not find herself, so how could you find her? The composer wept like a child, the feeling of his baby girl's lifeless body filling his arms. Grief got to her knees, wiped the tears from the composer's eyes, and embraced him. He put his arms around her, his first embrace since that terrible night when he last held Melody and he felt his pain subside. This pain was one he would live with for the rest of his life, but he saw now it did not need to be the only thing he felt. He could feel the warmth of an embrace, the comfort of a friend. In time, he might even feel joy again. The composer felt grief begin to melt away. He looked up and into her eyes, what do I do now? He asked. Grief smiled. Finish it, she said, and vanished. In her place, peeking out over the hills and the houses before him, was the first rays of a new day. The composer knelt there, the ocean waves lapping at his feet, and he marveled at the beauty of the new day. With no pen or paper at his disposal, the composer began to write notes into the wet sand. Music flowed from him as it once did. Inspiration gripped him. He laughed, the sound foreign to him after so long. He wrote in the sand until his finger went numb. And then he wrote some more. Finally, the final note in place. The composer stood up and looked down at the conclusion to his long gestating piece. He smiled, he was pleased. He looked up from his work, and off in the distance, he saw Melody. She was a child again, no more than six. He blinked, and she was gone. He did not weep for her loss, but thanked her for pulling him out from under the waves. She saved him. He recognized that now. Her love and the love he felt for her brought him back. She might not be a part of his life anymore. But she was a part of who he was. She was a part of his very soul, and always would be. He was richer for having been her father.
pictures at an exhibition starred Antonio Mateo Garcia and was edited by Rubes Marino. The music was written by Modest Mororski, arranged and orchestrated by Maurice Ravel, and performed by the Budapest Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by Rico Sakani. This adaptation of pictures at an exhibition can be found in Volume 5 of James Daniel Walsh's Manic Expression, a collection series entitled Hero. Stay tuned next time for plays from more of Manic Expression's talented members and find all of their other videos, blogs, and other creative endeavors at ManicExpression.com, the greatest community on the web.